Hi, Shabbat Shalom. Today is the Sabbath in the Jewish tradition, one of my several um, beloved traditions. And Shabbat is characterized by the feminine, the Shekhinah, the indwelling feminine presence. And so we welcome her on this holy, holy day that comes again and again. So I'm going to keep this very brief. I can feel the restlessness and the hunger in the room. Um, so I'll be as succinct as possible. But I'd like to open with a prayer from this book, Mother of God, Similar to Fire, which is the title actually of an ancient Orthodox icon. And this is a book that I did in collaboration with Father Bill McNichols, a contemporary iconographer and mystic who I love very much. So there are um, 50 icons of Mother Mary in all her different guises with my, by Father Bill and my accompanying prayers. So this one is called Nuestra Señora de las Sandías. And that, that's Our Lady of the Sandia Mountains, which are, is the mountain range uh, surrounding Albuquerque. I don't know. Those of you on, online will be able to see it, I think. Um, oh, yeah, and there's, do we have a screen? Um, it's a beautiful image of Mary holding Jesus with the, the mountains in the background. And here in New Mexico, when the sun sets in the west, does it set in the west where you are, too? I, it, um, the eastern mountain slopes are washed with this rosy glow. Some of you here are, are from New Mexico and you know this phenomenon. That's why this whole range is called the Sangre de Cristos. The Sangre de Cristo mountains are the blood of Christ mountains from when the sunset washes the eastern slopes with this, this deep red light. Madre mia, you gaze down from the summit of the mountain you have ascended and call out to us. The journey is the destination. Come. I have confused the path home to my beloved with just another task on my to-do list. I am in such a hurry to cross it off. You remind me that the divine is everywhere always and that I, all I have to do is open my heart and welcome her. That she shines from the setting sun as it washes the face of the mountains with light. That the blood of Christ seeping from all the broken seams of my life is healing, not punishing. That my weary legs are growing stronger as I climb upward and my bleary eyes are becoming clearer as I make my way deeper inward to that secret place where the mystery is waiting to receive me with the wide open arms of love. So I'm going to be as succinct as I can as I attempt to reframe Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of grief as stations of transformation, as portals to the sacred. I, there, I don't see any reason to jettison the whole structure of Kubler-Ross's stages, even though the idea of a linear process for grieving is ridiculous. <laughs> But there seem to be universal features in that landscape of loss, in that beautiful, terrible wilderness that every one of us finds ourselves in individually or collect and collectively at some point or another, especially right now. I mean, in some ways, I feel like I should just walk down those steps and end because, well, partly because you're hungry and it's late, but also because... There's nothing left to say. Every one of my beloved colleagues before me this weekend have all said everything that's on my heart and probably yours. 
Um, and everyone has named grief as the vibrant, living, characteristic and opening doorway to our liberation right now. When I started speaking about grief publicly about 20 years ago, following the sudden death of my 14-year-old daughter Jenny in a car accident that happened to coincide to the day uh, with the release of my very first of a dozen books, and that was a translation of Dark Night of the Soul. Those two events were exactly aligned. And I began to, because I hooked, how could I help it, to speak about the connection between the teachings of the mystics and the, particularly the dark night of the soul, and the, the most um, astonishing, shattering, and uh, huh, transformational experience I could imagine. And, and how that coincided with the rising consciousness around justice. So all three of these things are braided for me, like a challah. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. <laughs> um, but when I began speaking about it, people were like, oh, please don't talk about grief. I mean, I would teach at Omega Institute and there would be like six people signed up for, for my um, retreats on the, kind of the spiritual transformational power of grief and loss and the mystics. So now I feel like there's this rising, I mean, there's nowhere to hide from the reality of our personal and collective grief right now. So is there any use in some of these, these kind of um, maps that certain mystics like Kubler-Ross, who was flawed like the rest of us, offer? Um, yes. So. The five stages, as you probably all well know and have probably worked with in your spiritual companionship, are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Each one of those words is unfortunate, as Kubler-Ross admitted herself. Not only do they imply some kind of checklist that you you get through, and at the end of it, you're all you're okay, which implies that grief is like the flu. I'm not going to say COVID. Um, that you endure and get over, and then when you're done, you you move on. It's rather um, a lifelong journey, and some of the of the fires or oases, even I want to say, on that journey through the wilderness look like these. And so I'm just going to rename them now as contemplation, rebellion, lament, surrender, and returning. Denial as contemplation, anger as rebellion, bargaining as lament, depression as surrender, and acceptance as returning. The mystics, I've um, spent my adult life anyway, kind of reclaiming the wisdom of the mystics across the spiritual traditions uh, as luminaries for our own path, as ordinary, extraordinary human beings doing the best we can to turn inward and step up in, in this world. So there are I associate a, a mystic with each one of these for, well, let's, let's just dive in and, and try to distill. In the wake of a fresh loss, there's often an impulse that is contemplative, and that is to turn inward and be with what happened or what is happening. That contemplative impulse often results in a, in a thirst for solitude. And people around us might look at us and think that we're isolating and that it's dangerous, that it's pathological. But I think there's something in that inward drawing tendency in the face of the fire of what's happening that is healthy and right. And people will try to distract us so that we don't turn inward, but that craving that you have for a moment to be with it is holy. In fact, the whole, 
what's happening to our souls, I feel, and tell me if, I mean, you can tell me silently if this resonates with you and with your the people that you accompany. There is a fragrance of the sacred that permeates the shattered landscape of our souls in the face of great loss. It's when the veils are ripped and we're stripped of those ordinary um, kind of protections against the beauty and power of the sacred, of the mystery. And when we experience a shattering loss or a profound sorrow, those, those veils at least temporarily are taken away and the, and the sacred comes flooding through. We're conditioned to get away from the feeling of the pain that accompanies the loss. But there is also this great inflowing of holy fire that it's, I find that people I sit with don't want to say out loud because it's, it's not okay to be anything other than sad. When we experience these, these great losses, do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> it's, it's what I call the angels coming rushing in to that, to that broken open space. Um, Julian of Norwich, when she experienced the death of probably half the people she knew of the plague in, in um, the 14th century in England, had a near-death experience, and that's when she, she had her, her showings, the revelations of divine love of Christ the Mother. And Julian's impulse, once she uh, recovered from her near-death experience was to enclose herself in an anchor hold and spend the rest of her life unpacking what she saw when Christ the Mother revealed herself to her and assured her that not only you, Julian, but all of us, all will be well and all will be well and every kind of thing shall be well in spite of appearances, not a spiritual bypass but a reality that is bigger than and inclusive of the harrowing pain. I'm pretty sure as a grieving mother that Julian too was a bereaved parent and probably spouse. Often when um, we are grappling with great loss, there's an experience that feels like protest, like fuck no. It's not okay with me. This is not okay. I protest. I rebel. Kubler-Ross called it anger. For me, it's a passion. It's a burning. It's a re rekindling of the life force after we've turned inward so deeply that we didn't think we could ever re-emerge. It involves deconstruction. Everything we believed crumbles. We die. When, the loved, when a loved one dies or when the injustice is so um, hot that everything burns. That deconstruction is healthy and needed. There's also a, a, an ability to set boundaries in new ways in this, on this station of the grief journey. The third station or portal for transformation that I want to name I would call lament. She called it bargaining. This is the if only. And again, we're invited to be with it, to, to not turn away from the monkey mind that's going to do its thing and tell us the story over and over and over again, but allow it to just run its course, as the monkey mind will do, running after every banana of thought. Like if you had only done this, and, and if they had only behaved like that, we could cut the, that scene and rewind it and reshoot it and it would all come out the way we would do it if we were in control of the universe and our own movie, the movie of me in which I star, whether I like it or not. So there is a powerlessness in this stage, but there is also a kind of fierce empowerment of lamentation. I see... Um, for the rebellion phase, I see Francis of Assisi as the great exemplar 
of rebellion. Remember when, in Francis's own lifetime, in spite of gathering his poor brothers and sisters, that's what they called themselves, the poor little brothers, right, and the poor little sisters, gathering, gathering his community, his sangha around him, in solidarity with the poor in an attempt to live a, lo a life of voluntary simplicity for the sake of all beings, of the inter interconnection of all, of all creatures. In his own lifetime, his order burgeoned into something that didn't resemble anything that he conceived of. And the next thing he knew, they were building cathedrals to the Franciscan order. And there was one one moment when he, when some church was being built and he climbed up on the roof and he started tearing off the tiles and throwing them to the ground and yelling, bellowing. That's rebellion. That's, that's the second station of the journey. This third station of lament I see as Miriam and her sisters as they crossed the Red Sea as it parted to receive the Israelites who were moving from captivity to liberation. Remember the Red Sea swallowed Pharaoh's army who Pharaoh had let them go and then changed his, his authoritarian mind and went after them, sent the army after them. And the army was drowned. And it is said that Miriam and her sisters, her, the other women who actually led the way through the Red Sea with drums and timbrels, singing and dancing, when they got to the other side, Midrash tells us that they fell to their knees and wept for the deaths of all of the Egyptians, not only the army, but all the, the male children who, whose pharaohs... Um, decree had boomeranged and, and killed. So that lamentation is our birthright. It is absolutely necessary for all of us to allow our hearts to break open on this path of transformation, of turning inward and stepping up. In the fourth station, of transformation, what, what Kubler-Ross called depression, I call surrender. And this is the dark night of the soul. This is that transformational power of dropping into radical unknowing. When the bargaining, the lamentation, the if only has run its course and exhausted us, and at last we surrender because there's nowhere else to go. And that surrender is sacred. And it's infused by total not knowing. It's an annihilation of everything we had believed. And that's according to John of the Cross, who is the mystic for this station, absolutely necessary on the path of maturing as a human being. We must enter into radical not knowing. It's holy. It's also the butterfly phase. It's when the, the what Teresa of Avila calls the ugly little plump white silkworm dissolves utterly. And this was long before science showed us that that's exactly what happens in complete dissolution of the caterpillar or the worm inside the cocoon to a puddle of imaginal cells. That's what's happening here. It's Jonah languishing, as John of the Cross says, in the belly of the great fish, suspended in the dark. It's also a time when we allow ourselves to simply be sad, to just fall back into the arms of sorrow and let the great mother who we can't even believe in, in those moments, hold us. It's exhaustion, but it's also rest. It's Shabbat. And finally, what, what she called acceptance, which is an equally unfortunate term, by the way, because acceptance implies that 
what happened is okay now. You know, it's actually okay with me that my daughter was plucked from this world in the beginning of her flowering as a beautiful 14-year-old black girl fiercely engaged in social and environmental justice who wanted to be a healer in this world. Not okay with me. It's 20 years later and not a day goes by when that's okay with me that Jenny died. So acceptance is just as problematic as depression as a term. So how about we reclaim it and reframe it as return. Teshuva is the word in Hebrew. Returning, turning and returning, which is a continuous process. It's not an end result. It's a commitment to being present. It's what's called in, in Buddhism and the Eightfold Path, the first the first step of the Eightfold Path, which is right views, being with what is. Richard Rohr calls it forgiving reality. That's this, this station, this opening on the path of transformation through grief. Not through grief as a place to get, get past, but through grief as a, an invitation for continuous transformation, personal and communal. This is a, a place of integration, and it's, and it's, um, it's a circular staircase, so we come back again and again and more deeply and fully integrate what's happened to us, what's happening in the world, showing up again and again for what is, with love, with the willingness for our Hearts to be shattered, but broken open. It's the place that the mystics call the place of union. I love Julian of Norwich's term, oneing. The place of continuous oneing. And this is the, the mystic for this station, in my heart today anyway, is Mother Mary. Who said yes. Who said yes anyway. Who said Hineni in Hebrew, here I am. I know that I am going to bear the unbearable, and I say yes. Not because I'm a martyr, but because this is the nature of this fleeting human condition, and what I want to do is stay here, like the Bodhisattva, not as a white-knuckled promise of perfectionism and purification and all of those patriarchal constructs, but as an act of love, of heartfulness. I'm going to stay right here until all my friends, until every last blade of grass, it says in some versions of the Bodhisattva vow, is liberated. Seifu tells me we have we have a little more time, so I'm gonna um, go ahead and read this this poem, and and Reverend Seifu is going to join me, and we're gonna have a conversation, and you too, with you. So this is the five stages of grief by Linda Pastan. The night I lost you, someone pointed me toward the five stages of grief. Go that way, they said. It's easy like learning to climb the stairs after the amputation. And so I climbed. Denial was first. I sat down at breakfast, carefully setting the table for two. I passed you the toast. You sat there. I passed you the paper. You hid behind it. Anger seemed more familiar. I burned the toast, snatched the paper, and read the headlines myself. But they mentioned your departure. So I moved on to bargaining. What could I exchange for you? The silence after storms? My typing fingers? Before I could decide, depression came puffing up. A poor relation, its suitcase tied together with string. In the suitcase were bandages for the eyes and bottles of sleep. I slid all the way down the stairs, feeling nothing. And all that time, hope flashed on and off in defective neon. 
Hope was a signpost pointing straight in the air. <clears throat> Hope was my uncle's middle name. He died of it. After a year, I am still climbing, though my feet slip on your stone face. The tree line has long since disappeared. Green is a color I have forgotten. But now I see what I am climbing towards, acceptance, written in capital letters, a special headline, acceptance, its name is in lights. I struggle on waving and shouting, below my whole life spreads its surf, all the landscapes I've ever known or dreamed of, below a fish jumps, the pulse in your neck, acceptance, I finally reach it. But something is wrong. Grief is a circular staircase. I have lost you. <laughs>